Hi, my name is Sverker Edvardsson and today I'm gonna describe how we can solve the Schrödinger equation exactly. Uh, and one non-trivial problem is actually the free particle system that we have in uh, nature. For example, helium is uh, consisting of one nucleus and two electrons and there are many other uh, systems like that and also with uh, exotic uh, particles like uh, uh, muons or positrons and so on. <coughs> and uh, if we set up the Schrödinger equation you will find that for the free particle system you will have uh, uh, you need to solve this kind of equation here. And then you include kinetic energies and also mass polarization energy due to that the nucleus itself is of course also interacting with, ele with electrons and also moving. And here are the potential energies, you know, electron uh, nuclei interaction from electron one, two, and then the electron electron, the most difficult interaction in nature, so called electron correlation is this term here. <coughs> And the wave function for the ground state of these kind of systems, actually it's enough to consider only three variables. The distance R1, R2 and the distance between electrons. <coughs> Unfortunately, obviously, if R1 changes, R12 also changes. So R12 is not independent from R1 or R2 which makes it a little bit more complicated in, in the derivations. So another way of express, expressing it is instead considering uh, the variable mu, which is basically, as you see here, cos theta. So obviously, if R1 changes, theta does not need to change, or if R2 changes, theta does not need to change, and neither does cos theta or mu. So uh, mu is an uh, independent variable. So we are going to solve this equation instead. And the normal procedure to do this is to make a, some kind of expansion of uh, basis functions. And uh, for correlated systems uh, it's very common to use the so-called Hilleros ansatz. However, in this, uh, what we do here is not doing that. We are instead discretizing in space, in the three-dimensional space, R1, R2 and mu. And uh, uh, in, it's uh, basically the finite difference method, but there are some extras uh, that we are going to do. Uh, but in that uh, way you can immediately see that uh, uh, you can avoid basis functions. So, you, so this is a very convenient method. However, uh, there are, uh, you know, if you have a grid, you don't get the continuum result. So that's a problem. Uh, and the, the continuum result is what we want. If you make the answers in continuous basis functions, you always get the continuum. Uh, continuum result, but uh, the question is if the number of basis functions are large enough to, to fully describe the true wave function. The finite difference method will always do that if we, if we go to you know, grid size zero, but we cannot do that in a computer. What we can do is uh, running several grids and then use Richardson extrapolation and then you can get the result for the continuum, the, uh, I mean when when the grid size uh, goes to zero. So uh, the, the method is very general and convenient, so, so we are going to do that today. And then uh, there are a lot of uh, ordinary conditions for when electrons come close to each other, so-called cusp conditions, etc. But let's not worry about that. Uh, uh, I could say a little bit about the boundary conditions here. Let's see if we can find them. Here is the Richardson extrapolation. 
let me see here where is it <clears throat> let me see here so you can understand a little bit more about what we need to do here here so uh, <clears throat> we make we don't calculate the wave function instead uh, we calculate the entity q defined in such a way that the boundary conditions become simple so uh, no matter what value psi has uh, when r1 and r2 is zero this will be zero so uh, if it's zero or if it's some constant value it's always limited we know that then this will be zero so the boundary conditions will be very simple using this function instead and you also see this cos theta or mu uh, you know when uh, theta equals zero okay and r1 equals r2 you have a cusp both electrons are at the same place but if you look here yeah r1 equals r2 no problem and if uh, theta equals zero cos theta equals one and one minus this is zero so then you have a uh, in this function you have that kind of uh, <coughs> boundary condition which is very much simpler than the Cato cusp condition which uh, experts are familiar with so we are making this very simple and uh, well that's all I wanted to say as an introduction there are more things to say about the, the choice of uh, R1 and R2 as, uh, as variables there are better variables of course, because if uh, the, the outer boundary condition, uh, you know, R1 is out to infinite, that's a little bit uh, troublesome if you use a computer. Uh, I, you cannot have that uh, kind of grid. It's too far out. And what can you do then? Yeah, you can uh, change the variable R1 and R2 to something that is limited, even when R1, R2 is infinite. So that's a really good trick. But uh, we are not going to worry about that here. So here is my C program. It's called uh, uh, Core Free P. It's uh, correlation free particles. And uh, uh, there are some information here in the program. Uh, how we solve it and why it's working and so on. So this is just ordinary uh, C code. And uh, here is, uh, yeah, let's say the, the mass of the proton is like this. You can find that in, if you go to uh, a good handbook. Electron mass is like this. And here are the reduced masses, etc. And charges. So it's basically defining the problem. In this case, it's helium. And uh, the outer... Uh, boundary condition is at uh, R1 equal 9 and R2 equal 9. Uh, it's easy to test that uh, in this case uh, uh, the electrons are quite localized so if you go out to 9 you, you're definitely gonna get uh, 5, 6, 7 figures easily. So it w wouldn't matter if you put uh, a thousand here you would get basically the same result but the calculation would take enormous time. So now I'm going to show you how, how we can do this. So, yeah, this is core3p.c, and here you compile it. So, there it is compiled, and then we run it. And uh, we're going to take, see how long time, CPU time it takes. And uh, this is saying that uh, you have a, a, a certain uh, grid. And you should uh, do nine subsequent grids, uh, finer and finer grids. And then we calculate the eigenvalue for these nine grids. And in the end, we are going to uh, make Richardson extrapolation and compare with other calculations. So here it's running. So that's grid 21. And you see the eigenvalues here. It's already grid 23. And you see that the eigenvalue is converging. And then next grid. 
and uh, the idea is that the eigenvalue should come closer and closer to the continuum value, but we will never get there uh, when we use finite difference method. But what we can do is uh, do the extrapolation later on. And for the finer grids, uh, the system becomes heavier and heavier uh, to compute. As you see, the iterations are not that fast anymore. It's a three-dimensional problem, so it's uh, uh, the, the corresponding Hamiltonian matrix is not uh, really sparse. It, it's a lot of stuff due to the finite difference formulas I'm using. Uh, uh, they are of higher order, so it's uh, a little bit more tricky. And uh, the vector size you see here at the moment, 53,621. Uh, so the matrix is 53,621 times 53,621. So it's already a pretty large matrix. <coughs> Fortunately, we are only looking for the lowest eigenvalue, the ground state energy. And uh, you can also see here, this is the error uh, basically, uh, if the Schrodinger equation is, uh, you know, Hamiltonian times Psi should be equal E times Psi. So we, if we take the difference, H Psi minus E Psi, we should get zero if Psi is a good eigenfunction. So that's basically what you see here for every grid. You can see <coughs> how good... Uh, the solution we have of the problem. So that's it.